part of the cloud again. Uh, yeah, the IPFS conf organizers uh, want to use source cred for kind of some signal on like who to invite to the conference. Like, is there anyone that they haven't invited who's been really active in the in the GitHub orgs? Uh, so that's why I kind of paid a bunch more attention this week to the, like the load by organization feature because I was like, oh, oh. that's right, I want to load cred for all of these orgs. Um, Interesting. Yeah, and then you know, getting the back end page rank stuff to work will. Uh, make it a little bit easier, I think, for the work Z is doing, because then we can actually test that the page rank is canonical, or, or that uh, the Python implementation of page rank is like matching our JavaScript implementation. That's a uh, test I really want to run, one where we actually just run them side by side and just compute like um, distance metric and sort of verify that it's within like tolerable, hopefully like machine precision error if we get the algorithm lined up. Yeah. And I think I'm actually pretty close to being able to do that for you, Z, because uh, I think that if I actually were to just take the pull requests that I already have uh, out there, uh, and then we could use that to serialize all the scores, and then I can send that to you, you know, just commit that to the, uh, to the GitHub like I did with the other stuff. Nice. And I actually set up a thing that compressed actually using the infrastructure that you put together, plus the stuff that I worked on when we were together, to actually be able to run a notebook that only has like five cells and actually just runs and plops out the results from the, the Python page rank. Nice. Uh, and I see we have a, a new name in the meeting, uh, James Wog. Uh, nice hey. you, James. Thanks for posting the link. I'm just here to listen and learn. Cool. Uh, what, what brings you here? I'm actually, <clears throat> sorry, uh, familiar with Zargum's work, um, learning more about source cred and working on a project that is in a similar, you know, design space. Cool. But excited to, you know, listen and learn more and potentially collaborate in the future. Just don't mind me. Uh, I'm yeah. happy to participate though, if you need That's me. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Feel free to ask any questions, you know, if you're, if you're, is anything you're curious about. Uh, you can also take a look at the agenda that uh, Brian posted and kind of see what's what's on there for us to chat about. Those are some pretty personal things. I thought um, the hackathon, and uh, I yeah. had a question for William, but yeah, let me pull out the PM. I was actually just uh, I owe you guys, or I owe us, I haven't done the notes for last week, but. Um, I um, wanted to mention that is, if we can be as explicit as possible about how to, what we can do in the research repo, then uh, other people, I'm thinking of myself, can contribute more, basically. Um, totally. Yeah. About how to just set things up. I know you guys have, I, I have you know, I, ideas about um, how everything should work. And if there is, like, legwork that I can do, I'd love to. I just honestly don't. Uh, know exactly what, what what to do if I started. For, for my part, I'm thinking that, you know, right now we're just sort of like trying to figure out what the infrastructure needs to be and just starting to sort out how that's going to relate to specific experiments. Okay. But I do think that, you know, one of the most immediate things that matters, at least from my perspective, is I am not a, like, developer. I'm a researcher totally. So like even with what I just pushed in my exploratory branch, there's something that I could say is somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of the quality it would need to be to be infrastructure. And like even just like talking through what I did and why I did it with you, if you wanted to try to get that to the sort of grade where some of those things to the grade where they would belong in um, in Dandelion's infra folder, because I certainly am never going to think, wow, something I wrote belongs there. Um, For sure. Uh, but then, of course, that work is there primarily to substantiate a, a more streamlined research process. And I will say that at the moment, that's still kind of an ideation. We're starting to converge on some vectors around clearly being able to make this test between our implementation, you know, this infra infrastructure version of the implementation with the in with um, the one that's implemented in the code, setting up experiments that allow us to do sort of like the kinds of AB or parameter tests that would allow us to justify making changes in the production implementation. And then, like, like I said, before, like, like that's the sort of storyline, but we're still sort of, I think, filling out the tools that we need to do that in a, um, what I would say, 
in a scientific way as opposed to in just sort of a like random walk way. Okay, for sure. Yeah. So you do you mean just kind of like to some extent just like clean up what you've written? Um, or on? tell me, I mean, like, to be honest, I don't just mean clean up. I, I wouldn't mind going over it. Like, there's a reality that it might, it might be code review. It might be, I, uh -huh. the, leap, the leap here is that like, I'm not just writing code that needs to have it be reviewed. I'm writing code that I wouldn't say is like, I don't, maybe it's a self identification thing, or maybe it's an experience thing. Like I'm doing work that's based on my mathematical experience. Cause I've done a lot of work with, with algorithm design in, in networks and including with PageRank, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I've been, that code was actually a lot of it 10 years ago was in MATLAB. So I learned Python since because I've run a data science team, but like, I'm, I'm just basically saying, I don't, I, I have another team member going to be joining me soon on the project, but I also think that I often write like experiments and tests and analysis that is, if we decide we want it to be repeatable, there's a different set of tasks associated with making those same kinds of experiments repeatable. And there's gonna be other work associated with repeating experiments. My ideal vision for this is we get enough infrastructure in place that if you have an idea of something to try, you don't depend on me or Dandelion or anyone else to be yeah. able to try your idea. And then yeah. if it works, you'll have a clear justification for your proposal coming from those, those experiments. But right now we, if you were to try to do that, you would have to hack most of what you were trying from scratch. The infrastructures mm -hmm. and the experimental like frameworks are what's gonna allow you to do it A, faster, and B, make it easier for other people to see what you did and understand its implications for the implementation. I see. That would be, that would be awesome. <laughs> Uh, and so if I remember correctly, Brian, uh, you don't have that much Python experience. No, right? no. I was going to say, actually, if, if, if just looking at looking at other people's Python and code would help me, and I'd be happy to just look at other people's code. If yeah, I could. So maybe one thing, I'm just going to add you right now to my pull request of uh, uh, in the initial code for importing cred graphs. Um, a question for you, Z. Uh, so when you describe yourself as like not having confidence to like merge code into infra and like know what it is to like produce like like well-tested robust code as opposed to like research or prototype code, uh, is that uh, a lack of confidence that is like a part of your identity that you want to defend or is that something that you're interested in changing? Uh, I am not opposed to changing it. It's not uh, this way. I like respect being able to do good work. Uh, part of it comes from it comes from a couple different things. I certainly would like to improve my skills, but when it comes to timing, time availability, it's a thing that I'm like, I can't really afford to prioritize. So what ends up happening is I can, I can be, I can add a lot of my prior knowledge, prior experience and capabilities very quickly by writing prototype code. When you've gotten a lot of, you will quickly get from me a lot of what's rare about me when I'm, when I have time and when it's right, I'm also totally happy to improve my coding skills. I'm just leery about syncing. I don't necessarily have an extra couple hours to sync like I would have even a couple years ago to be like, hey, look, I wrote this prototype code and I want to be a better coder. So let me just take, now I'm already sort of in some ways taking my, I hate to say it this way, but I'm like, I'm taking my quote unquote extra time to do real research because I'm running a company. So my <laughs> first tier responsibilities are like keeping my company running and all of my staff paid and everybody doing good research and them trained. And then I spend the next bucket of my time doing research like this that really excites me. But then the, the thing, the, the improving my coding skills kind of comes in the next bucket after that. And so I'm very open to it, but I'm like honest about where it falls on my priorities. Got it, that makes sense. Um, yeah, because what I was going to say is that if you do want to improve your coding skills, you can just send in your code for review by me and William. And then approximately all of the, you know, the, the time spent on that will all be sort of getting feedback on coding and learning more. I'd be good to get there. I think for the moment, I have a really high desire to get, like it's not, I want to get as much out to you guys as I can, which is why I want to work on graph generators. And I want, I have a, like a list of 
basically I want to get prototype code for as much sort of pseudo infrastructure or pre infrastructure and as much like experimental like setup, even if it's in if it's in prototype layer, and then it might end up being the case that the best use of my time is to refine that stuff. But I, I feel like a, a desire and a burden to get as much to you as possible in the in the area that's more my expertise so that it's as, it's available. Does that, does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, so Brian, if you're interested in getting involved in research and you're interested in learning more Python, uh, you could take the job of like, taking Z's like research prototype infrastructure and then polishing it up to get it into the, uh, uh, the like canonical infrastructure. Thing. That would so, be, yeah, that, that, that seems like a good use of everyone's time to me as well. I think that makes sense what Z was saying about uh, getting as much out there because refactoring it. I mean, I kind of assume that you and William could Maybe you wanted to, so that makes sense to me, and I can work on it too. Cool. I think you're having connection issues. Is anyone else having that, or is that just a man? My my connection like bugs out like once every ten minutes. I don't. Okay. Yeah, anyway, it's now. Um, so is, this is what I was talking about, Brian. Just so you know, so these are dot pied. This is Dandelion's import graph, but I wrote this page ranker thing. That is, I mean, it's not awful. It's just that like I was saying, it's a level of experience and trust. And like, mm -hmm. I, it might, we might find that we can just collab on stuff and that it's pretty easy to go straight to infra, but I'm, you know, some of it is also might be in my head because I've, I've always, I've always been either a researcher or the head of a research lab. So I have just not had to be the person doing it. So I've never really thought about getting good at it at the last mile sense. <laughs> Got it. So um, maybe what we could do is, uh, Brian, you could just go and PR some of these methods against master. Uh, and then Z, you can kind of watch that review and like to the extent that you're interested, you can kind of like see what kind of feedback is like getting, coming to the code and what kind of changes are getting suggested and what it looks like to test it a little bit. Uh, but that's then Brian the can part actually part do the work of like I mean, that's the main the part I need help with. So like if he, if I get, if we, if you're able to help me a little bit, uh, Brian, with like, what is like, how would one test this thing? I will also become more confident because if I know how to test something, then I will be a lot more confident about submitting a pull request because if I have tested it, I will feel better about okay. saying, hey, you might want this. Okay, yeah, I, I would be down to do that too because unit testing is one of my passions, I'd say, so. Uh, but Brian, I just keep liking you more and more. <laughs> yeah, I, I've built a lot of stuff on my own, so unit testing is like your best friend when you're, when you're building, oh, when you're a sole developer, you know? Absolutely. For me, I just like, if, if code isn't tested, I just feel no confidence. In it. It's like, what, what is this? Like it could be doing anything and then it's going to be impossible to change or refactor later because you'll have even less confidence in it afterwards. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You tear yeah, things test. down and start from scratch again. And then it's, yeah, I've, I've done, I've, I've been down the road without tests before too. And it's not, it's not fun. <laughs> yeah. Likewise. Um, cool. So that sounds good. And so maybe, maybe Z, you can just kind of like uh, file GitHub issues that point to the files that you think are like, like ready to like go through this process of like having Brian extract it to, um, uh, to the info code. Uh, and meanwhile, I'm gonna go and I, I'll put on my own to do it. In fact, I'll just go and make an issue for this. Uh, I'm gonna set up some tooling and continuous integration for the research repository. Uh, we're going to be using this tool called Black. Uh, Black is a very opinionated Python code formatter. Uh, it's called black as in you can have any color you want so long as it's black. Uh, so it, it just is going to be very opinionated. It's going to make our code look in a consistent fashion. I love automated tooling for just like removing the ability to argue and nitpick about how code should be actually laid out. Uh, so I'm just gonna get that turned on and I'm gonna get it hooked up to CI so like nothing will pass unless it's formatted properly. Um, so I'm going to do some infrastructure there. I'm going to write an issue for myself right now, actually. That sounds reasonable. 
I did notice that Network X has a PageRank implementation. Is that something we would use or? Uh, so I didn't use it. Um, I'd have to go back and look at what, what the, what implementation it has, but because we're actually working on the algorithm, it doesn't make a lot of sense to sure. use okay. a built-in like, is it's a, it, it sort of obfuscates it. If that's the precise thing that we're in researching, we need to be precise about okay. what we're doing. You see what I mean? Okay. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So on the research side, I'm also, I'm going to look into, I'm going to try to get CI for the notebooks so we can verify that all these like Python notebooks are like not throwing errors. I'll see what I can do. Um, and I think that the other thing that I'm going to do for you is I'm going to finish up the page rank stuff so that we can get the page rank scores from the JavaScript implementation as a reference case. Uh, for the Python implementation. Um, yeah, I think that you mentioned, so I, I definitely, one of the blockers there is just getting this code merged on the source code side. Um, so I know that you said, uh, Brian, that you had some like, questions about it or you kind of wanted to, to discuss it a bit. Oh, about running PageRank on the back end. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I'm good there actually. If I have, more specific questions about you, I'll ask that on cool. Discord or something, yeah. Uh, we could chat a bit about hackathon logistics. That would, that would be good. I have a few points on, a few comments, points, and questions on that front. I don't know, I don't have to go first though. Um, so I'll just say that I've been, I've been reaching out to people. Uh, I've been, I've been trying to uh, find some more people for our team. Uh, so I talked to the OS coin and Gitcoin people and mentioned that, yeah, we have a hackathon, we have travel funding, we're looking for like JavaScript hackers who would be like excited about this project. Uh, and they both said they'd reach out to some people and get back to me. So I think uh, that may yield another person or two for the team. Cool. Uh, ZX said he's out. I talked to him the other day. I think I told you that, yeah, that told time, which means we have three, we need five to six. Um, there's a little bit of a pressure on the organizer side for us to conf get and confirm people because we're already sort of, most people had to do that beforehand because they asked me to bring a team. I've gotten some leeway, but there's also, it's not infinite leeway. So um, we probably need to sort that out pretty soon. Um, yeah, so maybe we should say by like next Friday, and like kind of yeah. set, set ourselves a soft deadline of next Friday to like get some people. That sounds great, actually. Um, I have at least, I had enough thought or two. Um, uh, I might re reach out to, are you familiar with uh, Relevant? That's a New York based project that's yeah. similarly like trying to figure out how to sort of curate um, activity for people. The, um, I know the project lead he or someone he knows might be it's just it's mostly about the motivation that, that like, it's the skills and then the like motivation which are the things that jump out at me right like totally. as opposed to just like randomly asking i'm that's kind of my guiding principle um uh the in terms of motivation the, the event organizer and the particularly the track organizer from nature 2.0 um, wants to do, I get, they're doing this with every group, but they're doing onboarding videos where you talk about what you're excited about and what your project is and about your team. We need to have two or three people on a call. We don't have a date yet. Jonathan is happy to do the coordinating to, to help find the time with them. Um, but I, I mean, it's seeming to me like it's going to be the three of us because the three of us are going and, um, that's, if we can get a time slot that works for the three of us, the challenge is that they are based in Europe. So um, it's probably early in the day. Um, I will try to keep it. I try to push them for like 9 a.m. Pacific type times because I, they can't do much later than that. And I don't want to do much earlier than that. Um, yeah, that's good. But I think you'll see, we'll have a little bit of follow up around um, sort of vision and how we want to articulate ourselves. Um, I called the team name, I think I called it Emergent Intelligence. I literally was making it up the, the day it was due, basically because I was thinking about the intersub, actually I wasn't using the term intersubjectivity, but I was using that concept we were talking about with Evan just in terms of how like, 
there's this like subjective objective hybrid reality and we want to capture something out of that and so i just yeah anyway the point is i called the team emer emergent intelligence it made them happy um we're gonna <laughs> run with it however we want um jonathan is probably gonna send an email to you and i at least uh dandelion to try to like help prep he's much more of a let's just say he's much more of a business management consulting project management type and i pushed on to him the responsibility of soaking up as much as possible of the expectations of the hackathon like organization and track but he's probably going to come back around to us and say here's what the team's actually going to need to you know we have to communicate we're going to have to say who we are and what we're doing on these time frames but try to make it low impact on us so that we're not spending a ton of time on well what i would call marketing <laughs> cool and so brian uh does joining a call with the two of us where we'll kind of like i guess like pitch the team for posterity or something work for you Uh, we can't hear you, right? I'm sorry. I had to cut out for like five minutes just a moment ago. I didn't hear what you guys were talking about. Oh yeah. So basically, the hackathon organizers want us to submit a video with two to three people in the team. Sure. Uh, just talking about the team and what we're doing. Yeah, love to. Cool. I suggest um, before that watching or reading a little bit of the material that's put out by Nature 2.0 because that's the okay. sponsor of our, our section and it's very like very big vision very like it's going to be kind of storytelling -y. it's a little bit it's important but it's also just clear that I think they're going to want us to be kind of I don't know <laughs> never mind it's 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 a weird thing for me because I struggle a little bit with the um with the things that feel like they're more narrative than um, than content. But my ex sense of from talking to the track organizer, I mean, the track is called like building the unimaginable. Like it's very like, like we need to be prepared to like talk in a grandiose way about what we want to accomplish, even though as individuals, we tend to be prone towards breaking the problem down into something that we can really do and doing it. <laughs> So for what it's worth, I, I think I'll have no trouble guiding this conversation in a grand, suitably grandiose fashion. Because I think this whole like, like nature 2.0, building ecosystems, open sources and ecosystem, you know, it's going to be a new economic paradigm that's better aligned with like, you know, the fundamental nature of the production of intellectual property. I'm all over it. I, I get along I, with these guys really well because I share that vision. But like, <laughs> I always feel like when I'm dealing with them, like I always feel a little stretched in the direction of, of narrative over reality. And I wanted mm. to like prime you for that. Yeah. I think that's great. I think the source code vision, actually, the way, I mean, I, that's one of the more appealing things about this project is that there is sort of like, there's some great practical stuff to work on, but it also does have this like big horizon, you know, vision that could be awesome, you know. <laughs> well, and I think Dandelion, when, when we were talking in person, the thing that you said that I think is gonna be really important for this and for the Nature 2.0 guys is that they don't want us to come and say, hey, we're hacking on an existing project. They want us to be stretching, but we talked about stretching in the sense of focusing on the ways in which source cred could extend beyond just Git workflows to more general commons. And that's like slam dunk for them. So even yeah. though we're building off of like, you know, knowing each other through source cred, et cetera, like, in order to get both the tie in with the nature 2.0 and the ability to say that like, you know, we're doing a hack project that's like, you know, builds on, but isn't necessarily just working on the project source cred. We really want to focus on the ways in which what we've learned and what we've been doing extends to bigger and better commons. Got it. Cool. I, I, one of the, one of the phrases that Dandelion has used before that stuck with me was the idea of, if you could uh, uh, trade value instead of uh, negotiate, basically, I think you've used that analogy before. Do you remember that? You said something to the extent of like being paid for like what you do instead of being paid like for like your yeah, negotiating. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's, it's sort of right? like being a poor negotiator. I love that idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of switching switching a lot more of it from like negotiated upfront contractual like you do x you get y to like you just have a stake in the value you've created and then as it grows you continue to like have a larger stake 
Yeah, I, I think of it as like a lot of the, it's sort of like being a sharecropper versus being like an independent farmer. Uh, I kind of imagine a world in which everyone's like open source contributions are like something that is like, you know, it's in the commons, but it's also durably theirs or durably connected to them and you just reward them for the work they've done. Clearly just network dynamic resource optimization, allocation optimization. Right. No, I mean, I say that it's funny because it's just like a thing that conceptually, mathematically, a thing I've studied for a really long time. And I like your articulation of it. But like in my head, that very thing is about recognizing this sort of dynamic flow of value, like hetero heterogeneous value between heterogeneous agents. And you're like, well, what is that? Well, it doesn't make sense without sort of the dynamics inherent in the way that nature works. Like there isn't a lot of contractual negotiation for exchange of anything. Everything is just basically flowing on gradients relative to some natural laws. And while we can't perfectly replicate nature in the sense that like, um, you know, we can, we have to, we have to instantiate the natural laws that exist in our in our common platforms, but we can think of them more like natural laws that allow things to flow between rather than preemptive contracts that say, I do this, you get that. I'll also say like, I think that in a certain sense, the, the current capitalist economy, globalized capitalist economy, does a very good job of having really robust like supply chains and resource flows for physical objects. So if you, look, if you were to go and like decompose the supply chain for an iPhone, you'd find this incredible, like to a large extent, I think self-organizing, like kind of self-healing system that have all these different entities, like passing different resources along. I uh, told you that the actual lead of my, my team's like consulting practice is like a 35 year old supply chain systems veteran, right? Huh. No, I didn't know that. Uh, whatever. The point is, he actually does that. He breaks out the supply chain of an iPhone and as a way of explaining how, like these sort of systems to people, even when we're talking about digital ones. Like he actually does that exercise on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah, but so I, I think what we're doing is trying to build systems that can propagate like rewards and resources back along the intellectual supply chain and not just material supply chains. I like that. I like that way of thinking about it. I like the way they think about it in general. I think these very, these very like high level uh, theoretical academic stuff is also like very interesting. Like, like I'm thinking of like a, a blog post or something like this was a, this would be content in a blog post that I would definitely read. Um, yeah. And it's also, would, is it more accessible and interesting to people than like strictly like pay drink on a JavaScript graph or something? So, I mean, it's something to think about. It's, yeah. I would love to get some help producing interesting blog posts. That, that, that's a lot of work. I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't, I, would, I, I wouldn't like want to push you into that. Unless, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the issue for me is I just have like so many things on my plate. Yeah, that, that's almost, yeah. The, yeah. the number of, of source cred hats yeah. that I'm wearing. Yeah. Uh, and so stuff like producing blog posts has always been like, uh, it's honestly, it's, it's part of the out of my comfort zone and going and like getting the page rank stuff to work better so we can get the data to Python yeah. and like yeah. setting up the CI is all more in my comfort yeah. zone and it's also important, so. I think it's just, it, it, it's, it's good to keep in mind that it's interesting to people like the, 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 the stuff that sounds very theoretical and, and academic, it's still, I think, has a lot of traction in people's minds. It's fun. Um, yeah, I've actually found the, the, I mean, this is a bias. I tend not to write as much as I feel like I should, but um, it's because I'm prone, kind of like Dandelion, to want to get my stuff working. And so the bridge that I found and I haven't done enough of is when you do get experiments and running and like you have results, you can actually take things like those notebooks and actually you can now host, I think you can, there, somebody on my team was figuring out how to integrate so that you can have um, the connection between like your GitHub and your actual posts and actually have people um, sort of read and play with the kind of here's what we did and why Oh, and by the way, here's the link to where it's hosted. So you can even play with it yourself. I find that kind of thing a lot more appealing even than just the purely academic articles, because I feel like there's just so much tongue wagging that like once you're doing the work, you don't necessarily, and I know it's a little bit of a personal bias. I find myself trying to avoid um, throwing my hat in with the things that don't have as much work behind them. And I, I, I'm way more enthusiastic about getting running, even if they're storytelling notebooks about how algorithms work and why over even just writing an article about that. Hmm. Yeah, I think it also reach different audiences. I think as Brian was saying, there definitely is an audience just even for the purely theoretical sort of why, the, the why 
It's like um, anybody so, that likes social sciences should like that stuff, that sort of idea, I think. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, maybe uh, you mentioned, Z, that uh, I think Abby Titcomb, who has like come and like talks about touching base next week, would be a good idea popularizer. I actually talked to her earlier. She joined the Discord. I mean, she's doing a bunch of stuff, but actually she's currently writing much more like articles like you're describing on some stuff that I, I helped design and that she's worked, done some work against and was really enthusiastic about this project when I told her about it because I've, you know, obviously I have an ongoing like collaboration talking about stuff and she's writing these articles and I pushed on the very thing that sort of motivated you, which is you you can't have systems without without you know sensors you can't if you can't measure things you can't like there's a lot of things you can't do if you don't have proper measurement and i think the discussion that was at the end of our meeting on tuesday about the fact that if you can measure capital and you can't measure labor what happens <laughs> <laughs> um sort of trying to figure out what 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 measurement looks like in the in these systems yeah, so Brian, our, our hypothesis for what happens if you can measure capital but can't measure labor, which is definitely the state that cryptocurrencies are in, is that you will have really exciting wild gyrations in the value of capital uh, because <laughs> of the positive feedback cycles and like measuring capital. And unfortunately, not as much work will actually get done. That's interesting. Because the labor isn't observable. So, so it's um, therefore not very optimized for. Interesting. So there's your, that would be the, the entertaining, um, that would be the entertaining theoretical social science article would be to describe this, like suppose, you make this supposition, like suppose labor is not very easily measured and capital is easily measured and you then introduce basic thought experiments and what would happen, you come to the conclusion, then you're just like, and crypto markets. <laughs> Man, I could actually probably just make a good tweet out of this. <laughs> I, think that, yeah. I think that concept could fit in the tweet. Uh. Um, Hey, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but that sounds awesome. I just wanted to say that that uh, premise is really strong. I'm I'm excited to, you know, happen upon this this random call here. Uh, <laughs> cool. And maybe I could offer my help in any ways, uh, you know, that might be, uh, you know, appropriate. Uh, That'd be awesome. What kind of help can you offer? Well, I've been thinking of a lot of ideas while I've been listening and and diving into the source grid repository. Um, I'm working on a project that could use your tool to, you know, quantify the work being done to build out a, a functional prototype um, that's up and running currently. Um, so we can send you that, that repository, get your feedback on that approach. I could also offer my help in terms of marketing and support around just content development and, and uh, you know, sharing the word. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Because uh, I, I do really love what you're doing and i think uh we've got a lot of shared goals i think uh we can coordinate and and uh yeah i think uh relevant zargon brought up is another project that you might want to uh get in touch with um hmm. yeah, i'm I, gonna be I in new york similarly now. recommend their uh you know their team is is a great great one to connect with um but yeah sorry to Oh, go ahead, sorry. Jump so, in. I think I'm going to introduce them anyway because I'm hoping to get somebody from their team maybe on the hack team since mm. it's a similar, conceptually similar motivation. Yeah, sorry to hijack the call. I just wanted to offer my help and, uh, you know. So one idea that I've had, uh, I recently, so for a while I was thinking, man, it would be really cool if we had a bot that uh, was like a way for us to all run the source cred Twitter together. Um, and what I had initially been thinking was like, what if we had a, uh, a channel in our discord that was just like the tweets channel and like everyone, like obviously not anyone random person who joined the discord could do this, but anyone who gave a permission to post in that channel could just like post a message and it would be a tweet that would go out. Uh, and then I saw that somebody had actually made a tool for this. I think maybe it was called, uh, I'll have to find it again. Uh, but it was basically a tool where you could make a GitHub account. Um, and, or sorry, GitHub repository, where every, you have these .tweet files and every file that gets merged into this repository gets sent out as a tweet from the controlled Twitter account. And so we could potentially set it up where like anyone in the community can just like suggest a tweet and merge it in. And I, then it I would even be first class integrated with cred where you'd be earning cred and source cred for like getting tweets that people liked and then sending it out and we could like connect it to how many, how much engagement that tweet got. 
Uh, so that might be a nice way where we could just like let people who are interested in like helping to spread the word just like produce content that goes out throughout Twitter. So I gotta make a point, which I think you might like with that. That actually fits into the, the cred model. I think I told you about the red balloon challenge and the like network science research about how people um, were, there was a challenge where you had to find these seven red balloons all over the world and you'd identify their location. And then a bunch of different teams were like competing to find, determine the locations first. And the team that won was a, like Twitter, was literally an MIT based Twitter program where they just launched it they basically recommend add your friend to our team and the in the credit for finding the balloons flew back along who you recommended to for giving the reward so there was like a credit attribution graph that the rewards were for if you won you basically won a certain amount of money and so they just had this rule that said okay you know whoever finds it whoever like recommended them like would get some share in the rewards for winning and one they won the challenge and two they did a bunch of research based on it and they fa basically found that so like the social interaction was that people perceived engaging their friends as a favor to their friends not the other way around so like the links were at least interpreted by the humans involved opposite of what you would think of economically because you would naturally think that if you ask someone to do something that you are asking them to do a favor for you but the people were interpreting it as asking someone was doing them a favor because of the way the the re rewards were set up and the way that they propagated through the graph so i i might have to dig up a rep like an academic or at least there's a it's it's described in so how, how does that relate to this idea of having a the ability for everyone in the community to tweet by merging pull requests to get the community to grow by essentially getting people to tweet and then the, if you have credit cred attached to it and the people who are including new people are essentially um i guess the, I guess the way that i was thinking about it and maybe i was jumping too far into the math of how cred flows was that growing the community through Twitter would mean that you were essentially attribut attributing the adding of new people, which would expand the productivity, which would, which would expand the credit of the people who had gotten the people to join, who, anyway, sorry. So like in my head, there's a, there's a bunch of math of cred flows associated with community growth. And I was thinking of it in terms of like whether people would then view their efforts to um, to add people to the community as the reverse of like adding you as a favor to you as opposed to you following is, is you, see, you see what I mean? Like normally yeah. when, you, yeah. when you take someone's attention, you view it as, or I don't know, sorry, I'm rambling. This is not the right forum cool. for this discussion, but I have a bunch of graph okay, math me, bouncing around my head. <laughs> let me ask a different question. Okay. Uh, if we set up this Twitter, GitHub integration. Uh, would you guys engage with it? Would you guys use it to make tweets? I would love to have like uh, reviews on tweets because I'm a, you know I'll sit there and fudge over a tweet for too long, twenty minutes. You know, mm. uh, and that would be nice if you guys just to look at it before I send it out because you honestly don't want to like tweets with pull requests and reviews. Going. Yeah. <laughs> I think I would do that. I, I already okay. find Twitter to be a little too addictive for its own good. It'd probably be better if there was pull requests and reviews. <laughs> cool. Okay, yeah, I think I'll, I'll try and set this up uh, if I can find it again, wherever it went to. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think that'd be cool. I had a question um, too, as uh, yeah. I was thinking of, um, do we have any, uh, like, are there any models that we can think of of projects that are similar to ours that are assigning uh, value to contributions the way that we want to. So I'm thinking of like Stack Overflow being like the one that where they rank your contributions by like votes or something. Are there are, are there any other ones in 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 like any domain that we can think of that are basically doing what we're trying to do that we could use to model you know our own efforts against? Uh, well, so I think you know Gitcoin has a pretty different product. Mm -hmm. Uh, in as far as Gitcoin, Gitcoin is doing bounties uh, rather than like quantifying the value of contributions after the fact and like giving rewards. It's more like, you know, the maintainer or somebody else says, I'll pay $300 to whoever fixes this bug. Um, but I think that they've built a really strong community uh, and they definitely mm -hmm. have a really aligned values. I've spent a lot of time talking to the Gitcoin folks 
Uh, and I'm actually gonna, after, after this call is over, I'm gonna be hopping onto their community call to like give a source cred demo uh, to those folks. Uh, so I think Gitcoin is like definitely like uh, relatively aligned and we can like learn from them and they've built a flourishing community. Um, there's OS coin, I think has in the long run some similar vision to what we're doing. I think that they are kind of uh, approaching it from a different angle. Uh, I would say that like source cred thinks that, you know, we want to, among other things, produce a massively more sustainable open source ecosystem uh, by virtue of people getting rewarded for the contributions that they make. And the first piece or like one of the vital pieces there is actually be able to measure the value of contributions. And you kind of can't do anything with else without having that first piece. So we're going to build the first piece. Uh, I think OS coin has a similar vision that also expands to like an all open source development should happen on like peer to peer distributed infrastructure and it should all be open source itself and it should all be programmable. And so in my mind, rather than choosing an individual first piece to hack on, uh, they're kind of trying to build the future all at once. Uh, which I, I think that from an execution standpoint, I'm a little bit skeptical of, although from like a values and vision standpoint, I'm super aligned with the stuff that they're doing. Uh, and when I mentioned that I was reaching out to like friendly projects to see if anyone wanted to, to join our hackathon team, it was OS coin, get coin, which you have in mind. That's really cool. I, I err in a little the other direction. There's actually a decent amount of literature on statistical rankings precisely because of the whole like internet web 2.0 era and the tendency of people to be able to thumbs up and thumbs down things. Um, I don't necessarily think there's a lot of, of work that was done on sort of what I would say at the level of what we're talking about doing with the sort of networks and the flow of credit. Um, but I can say that like even in 2014, I was at a conference at Princeton where there was a whole section on the subject of how to create statistical rankings of things based on sort of crowdsourced information. Uh, what I think is so compelling about the source credit approach is that rather than asking for some like separate thumbs upping and thumbs down and curating based on sort of second order interaction with the behavior, it's actually being ranked based on the structure of the actual behavior. So we're not like ranking the behavior, people are just behaving. And then we're ranking it based on the information about the behavior. Hmm. Then I think that's a huge, that's a big- I, I agree with you about that actually a lot, quite a bit. That's a big deal. Um, the other group that's doing something really related actually is called Persper. Um, and they are doing something extremely similar in the sense that they are doing a page rank based algorithm uh, to analyze the value of like the work that developers are doing on projects. Uh, they uh, started by I think collecting this data set where they've taken a bunch of like open source pull requests and they have had uh, paid people who work on those projects to like rate the value of the pull request. So they've got like a training set on the value of individual pulls or commits. Uh, and they're running page rank on the call graph rather than on like the interaction graph in GitHub, uh, which I think in some ways is a better data source. And I, I do really want to get there as we like ramp up our own engineering bandwidth. Um, but they are not really open sourcing their stuff. They're talking about like eventually open sourcing it, uh, but they, they, they raised uh, venture capital money and they're like, I think orienting more towards like corporate clients and like maybe like corporate analysis stuff versus um, doing like open source through like credit rating open source projects. So kind of a different, like very similar approach and methodology, but kind of like a different angle on the problem is what they're doing. Well, if you change the underlying optimization problem, you're, even if you use similar methods, you'll get a fundamentally different system, right? So even if you have a graph and you have, I mean, we talked about PageRank is really a graph mixing process. And so when you define what, what heuristics you want to use and what objectives you want to achieve, you can use the exact same methodology from a network dynamical systems perspective to imply a credit with respect to some objective. The thing that source cred has, which 
kind of goes back to the point before is that it doesn't have an a priori KPI per se. The notion of what it means to be valuable is sort of self-referential, which is also what makes it intersubjective. But it's kind of funny because I expect a corporate focused tool to be basically optimizing against some sort of externally imposed KPI, which is viewed as if it's the truth, as opposed to sort of uh, having the process be thought of more as a sort of network self-discovery. Hmm. Sorry, I feel like that might be a little too much of a tangent, but it's it's kind of cool. That's a, that's a very important point, I think, because I, I actually think I brought up the point of in a, if we wanted to collect case study information that we could actually just ask people like what their, if they, if they had like a favorite five poll requests that they had done and sort of, the, it wouldn't be that hard to gather data that way. But I think what you're saying is that we wouldn't want to impose that on our graph necessarily, right? I think it'd be interesting data to have. Like, I can tell you that right now, if I run source cred on source cred, it will not it will not remotely agree with like which pull requests were most valuable. Uh, and it might be interesting if we had the data, we could start to look for heuristics. The interesting, the interesting thing that when we when we do that, when I've been toying with it though, is I start to second guess my own value judgments, and <laughs> I start to. You know what I mean? Like I started to think like, well, maybe this other one, I didn't really see it, but maybe it was more important and stuff like, you know. Well, I think that's what's so kind of cool about the self-referential nature of this is that like neither of those is inherently right or wrong. I mean, the idea, I, at least in my opinion, is that sort of having this evolutionary thing allows you to one, I mean, tuning the algorithm aside, even your behavior is going to change as a result of what's what's measured. Your your perception of how important something is will change, which will influence what you do, which will influence the graph, which will influence the like how things yeah. are rated. So it's really both unclear, but also really interesting to ask what the implications on the graph formation game that you know continues to transpire as your perception of what is valuable changes, and then what you do as a result of your perception of what is valuable changes. So, uh, yeah, I have, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to tell Z that I have like in the past brought it up at office hours that like one of my interests in this project is also just like if source cred could help me become a better developer as opposed to like the top down approach of like, you know, uh, helping people, uh, or, or, or distributing cred among a bunch of contributors. Like my personal interest is that if it could actually be a great source of feedback on how to improve as an individual developer, that would just, that would be an amazing thing to me. <laughs> Well, with that in mind, though, I would say back to your point about collecting extra data, there's a big difference between collecting data and wiring it into cred and collecting data to help validate and analyze and understand cred. So if you had like good quality developers creating a data set of like grading on, on work, then we could actually ask ourselves questions about how well the cred scores align with the quality of work. And I mean, I think there's like a, there's kind of, as I see it, there's always a big envelope of research that's much larger than the envelope of, of the implementation layer, which, you know, in this case might be, is it worth the exercising time and money and effort to build, you know, what I'd call test data sets that would allow us to do things like how well does cred correlate with this human measured concept? How well does mm -hmm. cred correlate with this other one? Like those are all the kinds of things where you would run computational or analytical experiment, you run experiments or you run tests against data sets that are not going to be wired into cred. You're just measuring essentially how well cred correlates with, um, with those measures. And, and that's different from making cred dependent on those measures. D Dandelion said something really interesting at the beginning of the meeting actually, when he said he lost context sort of on his pull request this week. Like, I think he probably contributed like I don't know, 1,000, 1,500 lines of code, a lot of code, I noticed. And it, from my perspective, like, it's, it's pretty easy to judge a pull request on my own. I can kind of tell you, like, how difficult it was, how much effort I put in. It's nearly impossible, though, to judge, like, a week's worth of effort or five pull requests or whatever. And that's another thing that could be really valuable is that it's almost impossible for me to keep that in my head. Um, my, my, my contributions across time versus just any individual one, though, uh, is relatively easier to, or I think pretty straightforward how, uh, 
my own my own self measurement of my value of my value on those would be a lot uh, more accurate. I think. You get what I'm saying? Um, and it's funny if you so assuming that you count something that happened eight days ago is within this week, which I think is like approximately correct. Uh, you're almost exactly right on how many lines of code I added. It was about fifteen hundred. One of the you things again, you about the networks, though, is that how valuable, at least according to the way that we're talking with SourceCrit is set up, how valuable the code that you developed now won't even really be realized until later. By its sort of definition, its value is attributed to what gets built on top of it and like how people engage with it. So there's a question of what the even right windows are for thinking about this. Can you truly have a network centric view of your contributions less than a week after you contribute it? Yeah, we've talked, we talked about that at one other office hours and that would be another really valuable thing if you could incentivize behavior that's going to benefit the project over the long term as opposed to the immediate feedback of your credit increase. That would yeah. be really, really interesting to me. And, and, and even identifying what those behaviors are, I think really interesting. Yeah, and that's what, when we do get the, uh, the ability to report kind of what is, what's the new cred in the past week, and that will really both be like what new things happened this week, but also what old work got more development on top of it this week, thus like yeah. becoming more valuable. Yeah. Uh, and that'll probably even be something that we can tune, you know, kind of like how much of your cred comes up front for like sending in the pull request and how much comes down the line as it gets dependent on. It makes me think about, you know, ranking boards that show like things moving up and down over time, like little green arrows, and little, red, little red arrows, but less in the dimension of people and more in the dimension of like the pull requests themselves. Like it would be interesting to see pull requests move up and down against each other over time in a leaderboard fashion, o almost more so than, I mean, I, I know people will always be interested in people, but I, I'm finding the building intuition for thinking about the, the value of the work is, I don't know, something I see is both interesting and important. We do have, we, ha we also have like issues on source cred that are almost more important than the pull requests themselves. Like Dandelion will lay out what he's gonna do before he does it. And the, the issue itself with William's comments on it is actually where they're doing the work. And that's another interesting example. That's pretty much how I learned anything I know about source cred was by reading those conversations. But I yeah. also noticed that there wasn't a lot of good ways to actually like I could like thumbs up things, but then that starts to feel weird if you're doing it a lot. So like I did, I started doing a little bit of marking and then I kind of stopped. But now that we talk about it, I wonder whether you would want a convention that got people to do that because how else would I essentially credit the fact that I learned about source cred from reading those. Yeah, so in the longer term, I, wanna, I want us to like, wind up building a Chrome extension or something that lets you explicitly put this information in. Uh, but I will say that personally, I make a habit of any time a, con any time a comment is like notably valuable, I'll try to thumbs up it. And so for example, when I'm getting pull request reviews, if like Brian adds a comment saying, hey, I think that you're missing a test case because like you're not testing this circumstance then I'll be like, oh, this is like a great point. I really appreciate people pointing out this in test cases. So I'll give it like a thumbs up or a heart. It's also uh, super meaningful when like you're a new contributor to a project when like the maintainer whom you don't know and you don't know if he's gonna like just kind of crap on your pull request, when they give you like a heart or something, that is actually uh, in, uh, a very nice thing to do, I think. They, they, they did that a lot in the previous, in, in one of the other repos I worked with, the maintainer would not always get immediately to your pull request, but he'd like put a thumbs up or put a heart on it just to tell you that he had seen it. And it honestly, like, it makes a difference. Yeah. So let's be liberal with our emojis, I think. Yeah. I, I think that is, I think that's honestly actually a good thing. Yeah. And it adds, it adds signal, you know, to the, to yeah. the graph. Um, quick, couple quick questions. Uh, Brian, are you a student? No. Okay. I'm, yeah. Um, I, um, yeah. It's cool that you, you, like, make so much time for open source contributions. I'm self-taught. I'm not a professional programmer right now. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I have like a regular job at a tax office. Do you want to be a programmer? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm heading in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I really want to like hire uh, another engineer to work on source code. Okay. Um, so I think that like asking you, would you like to work on source code full time is like a pretty reasonable place to start my hiring process, seeing as you're already working in source code and doing, you know, great stuff.
For sure. I'd love to. Yeah. Cool. So let's let's talk about that more than offline. It's just like this is the context where I, I get to like bump into you. So I forget oh, to ask. I'd, yeah, I'd love to talk about that. <laughs> um cool. Yeah, man. I assumed you were a student. So I was like, oh, I don't know, probably it would be like years until like Brian would be uh, available for that. That's cool. No, yeah, I'm is... I, I work at a tax office and like we end in April, we end like at the end of tax season and then I really don't have anything to do. I've always found like part-time jobs. So I'd huh. be totally available to work in April. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just talked to one of my other friends too, that, that it was, he, he was an open source guy on, on uh, the, the old project and he just got a job at Apple, like basically <laughs> through his open source contribution, which was inspiring to me. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I actually, I have a friend who was just about to go and drop 15 grand on like, some coding coding like boot camp that will teach her like java and angular and i was like mm, this seems like a lot of money to like get a super like broad base on a lot of different semi-relevant technologies maybe you could just go like hack on an open source project and then actually have like a portfolio to show for it um i think that's honestly like I was talking to this person yet last night about writing a blog post about this because there's so much advice about out there about like how to how to gain experience if you don't have experience and right. it seems like open source it's like an obvious thing that you would do that yeah well, actually you know maybe maybe is your is your website that's like chose repos by the number of good first issues still yeah. live yeah it is and it's uh it's taken on some I think I Brian right now. Froze up. Uh, there's a problem with fetching GitHub is throttling. I think you froze up for me. You said you said it's taken on some. Oh, I've uh, borrowed some of the UI elements from SourceGraph, <laughs> but I also had a question for William about this because I think that they are cut. I think GitHub the API is cutting off the issue. Requ I, I I fetch all the issues and then rank the repositories, and I think that GitHub is cutting off those after like you get a thousand issues or something mm. because source code do basically doesn't show up and it's not because they don't it's not because um we don't have good first issues labeled it's because um they it's because they, you get, the api is cutting me off after i after i fetch a thousand issues basically yeah and i was wondering if that how to get either get around that or if that is um actually the, if that sounds correct uh you know what you know, this would be this would be a really good thing to talk about with William. So maybe we'll put the course chat questions for, for about running out of time. Okay. Uh, but you could potentially use the source cred mirror module to do this so that you can keep a local cache of everything that has been worked on, uh, everything that's already been downloaded, rather than re-downloading everything from scratch. because uh, yeah, as I as I look at the result, it's just there's way too few. Um, so I, I it seems yeah. more downloading too little. Uh, I think also like it looks like it's doing all this work on the client side, and I think this should really be happening on the server side. And then it this should. This is be an open source repo. I'd drop an issue if you have like really specific stuff. Yeah, <laughs> probably GitHub slash Brian Litwin slash Group First issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I actually have a lot of I have a lot of ambition for that project because I think it would be super useful for for new contributors. It really isn't a great GitHub doesn't have a very good API for looking at repositories that have a bunch of uh, issues that you could work on. Um, you can kind of search you can kind of search for them, but you find the issues. You don't really find the repos. And I think what you really want to do is like latch onto a repo more than just go try to because it, there's so much there's such a high hurdle to get over uh, when you start work on a new repo that. Yeah, you need to find repos that have good issues, not necessarily single issues that are hanging out there. Yeah, but uh, I, I should run um, just to like kind of recap. Uh, we'll probably have another meeting later where we'll do the video stuff with the Odyssey organizers. Uh, Z will communicate to Brian what pieces on the Python side are good ones to pull out. Uh, I'm going to do some work on just getting the CI better there and I'll get the page rank data out so that we can start actually testing our page rank over there. Um, so yeah. And uh, Brian, you and I should talk more about source grad gerbs. For sure. All right. See you later, guys. I'm going right, to see you. I'm gonna run. Cool. Good chat with you. Yep. See ya. And thanks for joining, James. <laughs>